Yo, what's good, Bills Mafia? Welcome to Rated Rev, a Buffalo Bills podcast for all of you wild, crazy, rabid, foaming out the mouth, Buffalo Bills fiends all around the world. Grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters. I am your host, Rev Rhodes. So listen here, whether you're a lifelong Buffalo Bills fan like myself and so many others, or maybe you're a, a newbie or even a bandwagon fan who hopped on the bandwagon a couple of years ago because you saw Josh Allen killing it. You love his swag and his 50 million different handshakes that he has with all of his teammates. It doesn't matter to me, okay? If you bleed bills red, white, and blue, then guess what? This channel, this show, this podcast is just for you. Guys, I am so excited. I don't know what to do with myself, okay? I can't hardly contain myself and words can't. I can't properly articulate the way I'm feeling, man. I am passionate about the Buffalo Bills. In case you haven't already noticed, I am passionate about the Buffalo Bills. And that's one thing you're going to know about me, guys. I am animated and I can't help but 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 be like this, man. I have been a Buffalo Bills fan for my entire life. Now, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, okay? But I'm older than you think I am. Matter of fact, I'll share a story with you to get you to understand how old I am and how long I've been a Bills fan. I remember very vividly, okay, uh, the last two Buffalo Bills Super Bowls against the Cowboys, all right, specifically the last one. I remember sitting at home as a little boy, okay, I wasn't even a teen yet, I wasn't even a teenager yet, I was sitting at home as a little boy next to my stepdad, who happened to be a Dallas Cowboys fan. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The Dallas Cowboys fan as my stepdad. We're sitting here watching a game, and I, I remember getting excited because if you remember that game, the Bills were winning. The Bills were winning. They were beating the Cowboys, and I thought for sure, man, oh, man, this is, this is it. This is it. This is the time when the Bills are going to win the Super Bowl finally, right, finally. Forget third time's a charm. No, the fourth time. This is it. We're going to win. Well, you guys know what happened. We didn't win. We lost the game. We lost the game to the Dallas Cowboys. Of all people, man, of all teams that we could lose to, we lost to the Cowboys. Not once, but twice. Twice we lost to the Dallas Cowboys. And I remember sitting there on my, on my sofa with tears streaming down my face as a little boy. Because I, I, I felt so much pain and hurt that my Bills, again, for the fourth time, second time in my memory, lost the Super Bowl. So I've been there, guys. I've been the Bills fan since the highest of highs when the team was flying high in the 90s. Jim Kelly doing his thing with the K-Gun offense, man. And you got my man Thurman Thomas, Andre Reid, you know what I'm saying, killing it. And you got Bruce Smith, Daryl Talley, all of these guys, Steve Tasker. I remember, man, when the Bills were on fire and nobody wanted to touch the Buffalo Bills. I remember watching Warren Moon, and I remember watching that 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 uh, that that rivalry between Jim Kelly and Dan Marino. I remember watching all of that, guys. I've been with the Bills for a long time. I told you I'm older than you think. <laughs> all right, but I'm not going to tell you my age. You can probably just guess it. All right, but I've seen the Bills when they're on the top, man, on the top of the mountain. And then I've also been with the Bills when they're on the lowest of lows in the Valley. Like probably so many of you Bills fans out there right now who don't know what I'm talking about, who never had that type of history with the Buffalo Bills. All you knew was pain. All you knew was hurt, right? 20 years, all right, in the, in the 2000s, just, just underneath Tom Brady and Bill Belichick's thumb for 20 years, and all you knew was suffering and pain. I'm telling you, Bills Mafia, look, there is hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There was once a time when the Bills were the talk of the town and when nobody wanted to mess with them, okay? It's just been a long time. But now, guys, collectively, we are together as a family, as a mafia, Bills mafia, and we get to witness the rise of the Buffalo Bills like a phoenix out of the ashes, okay? And now we've got a good team, but not just a good team, guys. These guys, this, this team right here, is destined for greatness. I, I can feel it in my bones. This team is destined for greatness. You guys feel it too. We are right there at the cusp of doing something 
miraculous. I'm getting my words tongue tied. Okay, that's how 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 much I can feel it. This team is 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 serious, guys. It is serious. We've got great ownership finally. Right, we've got some stability in the front office with Brandon Bean. I love Sean McDermott. I love what he's done. Okay, of course I'm not. I don't love everything that he's done, but for the most part, man, you, when you look at the totality of what he's done over the over the over his 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 tenure here with the Buffalo Bills, he's done a phenomenal job, phenomenal job. And he and Bean and his coaching staff have built a competitor, and not to mention Josh Allen. <laughs> Josh Allen. <laughs> All right, we've got Josh Allen, guys. We we have a legitimate top five quarterback in the National Football League. Let that sink for a minute. I don't know if 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 you guys can really grasp that, or if you really understand what that means and how how rare that is. Well, may, well maybe you do. Because you've been with the Bills for so long. You've been with the Bills through these ups and downs, right? Through the, through the valley of the shadow of death, so to speak, where we had no quarterback since Jim Kelly to speak of, right? Now we finally have a guy. We have a guy, man. Like, he's the guy. I put, I put my guy upon against any guy. I put my guy against your guy. And I'm, I'm, I'm betting on Josh every day of the week, all day, every day. I'm betting on Josh, man. Can I get an amen up in this house? Guys, look, I'm excited, man. I'm excited about this team. I'm excited about the direction that we're going. I love what Sean McDermott has done. Look, nothing is going, nothing has, nothing comes easy for the Buffalo Bills, right? We know that. For some reason, it's as if we were meant to take the long route. Other teams can seemingly hop on and hop in and out, you know, real quick, get hot real quick, make it to the Super Bowl. Cincinnati Bengals. Right? I ain't going to front. I'm still a little salty about that. But it's okay. They lost anyway. But for us, it seems like we have to take the long route. And that's okay. It just means that the reward is going to be so much greater. Right? It's just building up this anticipation this 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 eternal eruption is just building and building and building and building, guys. And I'm telling you, we are right there. I guarantee you the Buffalo Bills are going to win a championship here pretty soon. And the way that this team is being run by Sean McDermott in the front office, as long as we got the, these guys, we got Josh Allen here, look, we're going to win. I believe we're going to win multiple Super Bowls. I, I, I believe that, man. I believe that. They have built a team that is here for the long haul. We're not going anywhere anytime soon, right? And as long as Josh Allen is healthy, knock on as much wood as you've got. We're going far. And I can't wait for the day when the Buffalo Bills finally are able to hoist up the Lombardi Trophy. Man, look. I don't know about you guys, but I'm telling you right now, Bill's Mafia around the world is going to explode. We are going to explode and erupt in so much emotion. I I can't even tell you what it's going to be like, man. I don't know if I'm going to cry. I'm probably going to cry. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm, you know, because I'm a crier. I ain't got no shame in my game. I'll cry. I shed a few tears, man, because it's it's just it's just been that long, right? Long overdue. But once we get it, man, it's going to be so satisfying. So satisfying, Bill's Mafia. So just just be patient, okay? Just be patient. Hold on just a little while longer. Trust the process. Look, I, I know that sounds cliche. It's been cliche. That's, that's Sean McDermott's thing, man. Trust the process. Well, guess what, man? I'm drinking that process juice, okay? I'm drinking that process juice. I know it hasn't been... So it's been it's been bitter at times, right? It's been bitter. It's been tough to swallow. But where where has he where has he led us wrong? Right? Where has he led us wrong? We've been in the playoffs. How many years? Out of how many years he's been here? There you go. Right? Division around this year, AFC Championship game last year. We know what happened the year before that, right? Um, getting bounced in the in the wild card round by the 
by the Texans, but nevertheless, we've been there. Okay, we've been there, and we're only going to get better. Trust that we're going to get better. All right, guys, look, that's 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 enough of my of my little rambling, my little pep talk. I felt like I felt the need to kind of pep you up a little bit here. You know what I'm saying? Because I I know the last couple of years have been kind of hard for a lot of Bills fans um, to deal with, right? Myself, especially, guys, especially the last year. Well, this year, man. Well, I guess you could. I guess you can call it last year, right? Because we're we're now we're in a new season, the 2021 Buffalo Bills season. Man, was probably one of the one of the toughest seasons I, I you know um, in a long time, in a long time because we, we we the team experienced so much adversity, right? And then we overcame that adversity and we got into the playoffs and we were like on fire. I, I tell you, I, I kid you not, guys. I would have put this Buffalo Bills team this year that that showed up in the last few weeks of the regular season into the playoffs up against any team. And I, I tell you right now, man, we would have smashed everybody in a way. I didn't, I, I, did, I did not, I really believed that we were the best team in the NFL and the best team in the, in the playoffs this year, right? And nobody wanted to touch us. We smashed the New England Patriots, right? Shut them up, all of those ludicrous fans out there in, in, in Boston, right? All those crazy fans in Boston, you know what I'm saying? You know, whatever. You know, all of those guys with, yeah, you know, they rag on quarterback, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like those guys smashed them. Smashed them. That felt so good, right? After two years in a row, we done that to, to, to them, uh, matter of fact. But nevertheless, we smashed those guys in the playoffs, right? And then we were rolling high, man. And then we come into Arrowhead. Arrowhead Stadium. The division around playoffs. And guys, that was the Super Bowl right there. That was the best game I have seen in years. The best game in years. Phenomenal game by both teams. I've got to give my credit. I got to, you got to give credit what credit's due, man. The, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, they came out to play. And, 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 and they weren't the same Chiefs that we played um, earlier in the year. They came in and, and, and we were, it was like two giants going at each other, man. It was like, like Ollie and Frazier, right? And, man, we know how that game went. And, and that was a phenomenal game. And I, I knew, I knew that once Josh Allen's, through that final touchdown to Gabe Davis with 13 seconds left in the game. We won. Like so many of you out there, I knew we won the game. The game was over. He asked my neighbors, man, I, th- that entire, that entire series back, man, look here. I was screaming. I was going outside. I was, let's go. I mean, I was so fired up. And after that touchdown, oh man, I almost lost my voice until the final 13 seconds. And we know what happened. No need for me to relive that moment. That happened. But I said all that to say this, guys. I believed that this Buffalo Bills team would have smashed the the, the Cincinnati Bengals at home would have went to the Super Bowl in L.A. and embarrassed the you-know-what out of the Los Angeles Rams in their home, especially the way they played. They didn't want no part of, of, of Josh Allen and the Bills, I'll tell you right now. But it just was not meant to be. And that hurt. That I, I was so hurt by by the way this year ended last year, I was hurt too, but I wasn't hurt that much because I think we exceeded expectations. I didn't expect us to get all the way to the AFC championship game. So the fact that we got there and yeah, we lost, I was able to process and deal with it because I didn't really think that, you know, we were the better team anyway, but I was just glad that, man, we got to the championship game. This year was different because expectations were higher. You know, and, and, and in the playoffs, man, I really felt like that nobody could touch us. It's just an unfortunate set of circumstances that happened. 
um, that caused us, you know, to lose the game. But I believe, I believe, man, with every fabric in my being, man, that the Buffalo Bills will be back. This team will learn from it. They will grow from it. Josh Allen is taking notes and receipts. He's going he's gonna to be back better. This team will be better, stronger for it. And uh, Josh Allen is going to go nuclear. <laughs> I just want to say that. He's going to go nuclear on the, on the league next year. I just, I just feel it, man. He's, he's going to go bananas, crazy, whatever you want to call it. He's going off next year. Mark my words. Take a receipt of this show right now. Josh Allen is going to kill it next year. It's going to be craziness. All right. Leave no doubt. That should be the theme next year, man, for the Buffalo Bills. Leave no doubt. Somebody go ahead and make it make a t-shirt of that, man. Leave no doubt. That's that's the, you know, you know, Sean McDermott likes to have these things, right? Uh every year, trust the process or, you know, championship calendar, whatever, whatever. Leave no doubt. That's it, man, for 2022 season. But guys, look. I am pumped about what's happening with the Buffalo Bills this year. And this episode, episode one of Rated Rev, man, is going down. You guys are going to enjoy it. I'm enjoying it. Look, this is this is the time of the year that I really like. I don't know. I know there may be others, you know, who, who just, you know, who don't like the offseason, right? But I actually love the offseason, man. I, I love it, especially, man, because like what we went through, right, in the playoffs, what we went through, I was waiting for the season to end. So that way my it's like my healing, you know, my that my healing process couldn't really start until the season ended because I was so hurt and so salty, right? But so the so the minute the Super Bowl was over with, I was like, okay. Now I can process. Now I can cope. I can, I, can, I, can, I can do whatever I have to do to get through this because now the season is over and I can look forward to 2022, right? And so I love the offseason, guys. I do. I, I love, I love uh, what's going on right now with the, from the Senior Bowl to, to the Combine that's coming up next week or this week, actually, you know, to the, to the free agent process. Man, I love all of that because it gives us an opportunity to really evaluate the team. It gives us a chance to sit back and look at the team, you know, um, objectively, hopefully, right? You can look at the team as a fan, but with objective eyes, right? And look at them and analyze them and evaluate and see, man, yo, hey, where can we get better? I know the Buffalo Bills, you know, went to the division around but where can we get better? Where can we improve? Are there some guys that, 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 that they can bring, either whether it's via trade or free agency or in the draft, that can help get this team over the hump? I love looking at that. I love taking time to go through all of that, man. That's, that's my thing. I love it, man. I can't get enough of that. The only thing I don't like is that dead period, right? That dead period where, it's, where the draft is done. And, and the players are gone and they don't come back into training camp. Like that's, that's the, man, it's like, it's like a month of no football, no nothing. And I, I just, you know, I don't like that. But anyway, man, this period right now, oh, I'm loving it. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in episode one of Rated Rev. We're going to be talking about the Buffalo Bills offseason needs, okay? The Buffalo Bills offseason needs, but specifically we're going to talk about attacking the defense via free agency, okay? Attacking the defense via free agency. Now, look, I understand that we've got the combine coming up. I understand that we've got the draft coming up. But look, we, we can't look too far ahead, okay? Free agency comes before the draft. I understand that we've got the combine coming up. There's going to be a lot that, that, that we could cover and talk about, about um, as it relates to the combine. But, man, we've got free agency, okay? And that's an important a uh, time of, of, of the year, an important part on the calendar of the NFL. Uh, so many GMs, especially we know we know here in, uh, in, as, as Bills fans, man, that Brandon Bean, he cherishes the free agency, man. He loves it, um, and, and, and he uses free agency to set himself up in the draft, right? He uses free agency to meet needs, to fill as many needs as possible. So that way, when he comes into the draft, he's not having to be desperate. He doesn't have to have to reach for players that he wasn't able to get in, in free agency or via trade, whatever. He can sit back and re- literally just take BPA, right? I know that may sound cliche, BPA, where everybody should take BPA. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? He really wants to, to sit back and take it, all right? And if it happens to be in a position of need, then so be it. 
but he doesn't want the draft to dictate to him what he should do. He doesn't want to feel desperate to make moves because that's when you can make mistakes is when you jump and you start reaching for guys that you had in round three, but you feel the need to get them in round two or maybe even earlier in round two or whatever because you didn't feel that need in free agency, et cetera. You know? So he's going to take this time. He's going to take free agency to set himself up. He's going to fill as many holes as he can in free agency to make sure that when the draft comes, he's set. Now, I know what you guys, I know what you guys are talking about. I can already hear you. Rev, yo, that sounds good. That sounds good. But, yo, um, have you taken a look at the cap situation? Have you, have you, <laughs> have you taken a look at the cap situation, Rev? Because, look, man, it ain't that good, bro. Like, you don't look good at all. Yes, I understand the cap is what it is, right? I understand we're not in the most advantageous position right now, okay? But I trust Brandon B. I trust that he's going to do what it takes to make the necessary room to make the necessary moves for this team. He's a GM. He, he knows what he's doing. I trust him. He hasn't failed me yet. He may have made me upset, but he has not failed me yet. And we understand that, that there's ways to manipulate the cap. There's ways to do things, you know, uh, with player contracts and extensions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to, to free up cap space. We know that teams do it all the time, okay? And we also know that Joe Shane said when he got the, 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 the GM job with the New York Giants, he had said that they had already had a plan for free agency. And at that time, they were already, I think, you know, like, like their draft board was up through round four. He said, Bean Man, he said, but they got a, we got a, they got a plan for free agency. We already, we already got it. So, so we know that there's a plan in place, right? And we started to see some of it unfold, right, with the Saran Neal signing last week, right? Good signing for the Buffalo Bills. I, I personally believe, man, he's a good guy. You know, it fall, he falls under that, that draft develop and uh, extend mantra or philosophy that they have, okay? But we're going to talk about some more of those guys coming up here later. You know, but Brandon Bean is going to take, he's putting all of his focus right now on free agency, guys. And so that's what I'm going to take this episode to talk about this time. Episode one, the Buffalo Bills offseason needs attacking the defense via free agency. Guys, are you ready? Are you ready to get started, man? Look here. Hey, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Before we get started, before we go any further, do me a favor. All right. Do this for me for Rev. Get your favorite beverage, okay? And get comfortable, all right? And while you have the time, if this video, if this show is giving you any value, do me a favor, man. Smash that like button, right? Subscribe to the channel. Comment, right? Leave a comment. Look, we're going to get interactive here in the future, man. We're going to be a lot more interactive than we are right now. We're going to do live sessions, man. But I want to I wanna talk with you guys. I want to hear from you guys. But do me that favor. Like this video. Smash that like subscribe to the channel and leave a comment, man. But let's get it popping right now with the Buffalo Bills off season attacking the defense. Now I know what you're saying. I know I, I can hear you guys, but ref, how are you going to talk about filling holes on the defense, man? When the defense was number one in the league, bro, are you tripping? <laughs> I hear you. Drink some of this processed juice, man. Okay? <laughs> Drink it. No, I ain't tripping. Okay? But just like any business, any organization, any profession that you're in, you always want to take time to evaluate. You want to take time to evaluate your, your process. You want to take time to evaluate what you've done throughout the year. You want to take time to to take a fine a fine tooth comb and really just comb through every area of that organization, right? It's no different with the Buffalo Bills. And we can't do that, guys. And we, we, can't, we can't be afraid to do it. And we can't allow uh, success to stop us from doing it, okay? You follow what I'm saying? Just because we reached a, a, a level of success, a degree of success, does not mean that we can't evaluate and see where we can get better, okay? Yes, the Buffalo Bills, the 2021 Buffalo Bills defense was ranked number one. 
But can we get better? I mean, we're going to talk about it. All right. So let's just let's let's just throw it out there right now. Okay. The 2021 Buffalo Bills defensive rankings last year. Number one, total defense. Number one, total yards per play. Number one, passing yards. Number one, passing yards per play. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, we're not finished yet. Number one, first downs allowed. Number one, uh, number one, third down conversion rate allowed. Number one, points per game. The Buffalo Bills defense for the majority of the year, they were the number one defense in, what is that? Seven major statistical categories. Guys, look, make no, no mistake about it. The Bills defense was on fire last year. They actually carried the team for the majority of the year. Right. Especially when the offense was struggling to get their feet. Right. The Bills defense. The Bills defense carried us as we expected them to do. Right. We expected the defense to finally step up because in 2020, remember, it was the other way around. The offense was carrying the team and the defense was struggling. And now we flipped it in 21 in the beginning of the year or to the mid part of the year, probably it was a defense that was carrying the team and the offense was kind of struggling. And I know, man, I don't know about you, but I know myself. I was like, man, can we ever get two things that match? You know, it's like Friday, man. Can, man, Y'all ain't never got two things that match. You get, you get ham, no burger, right? Ketchup, no mustard, <laughs> right? That, that's kind of how I felt about the Buffalo Bills. I'm like, man, can we ever get these two things to match, man? Like, like we, one, one year the offense is, is doing good, but the defense is bad. The next year the defense is doing good, but the offense is bad. Yo, can we get them both to be on, like, in the same, on the same level at the same time? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? And like, but, hey, man, it is what it is. It took the, it took the offense a while to kind of get, get on track, man, but they finally got on track. But the defense, man, they carry the team. I, I, I applaud them. They were the number one defense in all of these major statistical categories for the majority of the year. And they finished out that way, right? They finished out that way. And uh, can you believe that they, they had all of that and yet no pro bowlers on the defense? Like who's in charge of that, right? Whoever's in charge of that, like they need to be fired because that's nonsense, but that's all right. They finally gave uh, Jordan Poirier and Micah Hyde their due, right? All pro, first team all pro, and second team all pro. It's, it's about time y'all finally gave them some credit for what they've done, they've been doing here in Buffalo. But it's all right. That's, that's, that's why winning the Super Bowl is going to feel so good because we get to rub it in y'all's faces, man. <laughs> Did I say that? Yeah, I said it. We get to rub it in your faces. and I'm, I'm, We're going to rub all that. We're taking receipts, man. We got, we got receipts. So you just wait for the – when the Bills, man, when they win the Super Bowl, bro, we pulling out all the receipts. I told you we're going to be insufferable. Y'all are going to have to deal with us for a long time. A long time. As long as y'all was talking about us, we're going we gonna, to we gonna, we gonna pull it all out. We ain't going to be. No. <laughs> man, I'm joking, but serious, man. All right, I'm joking, but serious. But, yo, let's keep it moving, yo. So, so, so the Buffalo Bills defense, man, was on fire last year. All right? It is what it is. We've got to give them their credit. And I am giving them the credit. But, like I said, we have to analyze. We have to evaluate this team for who they are and for what they do. All right? If we're trying to get better. That's the whole goal, right, is to get better. We don't want to be content, right? You can't be content. You don't want to do that. You always want to look to improve, look to be better, and that's what we're doing here. So when we attack the defense, in order to do that, you have to find, first of all, you want to look at the strengths of the team and you want to look at the weaknesses of the team. All right, but specifically here, and we're talking about the Buffalo Bills defense, what are the strengths of the defense versus the weaknesses of the defense? Right. I know it's going to be hard to find a lot of weaknesses. Right. I mean, come on, Rev. We're never they were the number one defense. What you mean? Weaknesses. Come on, man. Can you be objective with me for one second, please? Can we? All right. Let's be objective. All right. So let's let's talk about the strengths of the team. I mean, the strengths of the defense. All right. Well, first of all, they were the number one pass defense. All right. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this. OK, because I believe that when you hear me talk about the strengths of the defense, it's going to reveal some of the weaknesses. OK. So the strength of the Buffalo Bills defense in 2021 was their pass defense, right? We all know that. As Bills fans, we all know, man, look here, that, that pass defense was legit, right? Like, like the no-fly zone, you know, whatever you want to call it, like they had it on lock. 
Even I mean, even when Trey went down, man, that hurt me, man. But even when Trey went down, Levi Wallace and Dane Jackson, they stepped in, man, and they, they, they played well, man. They stepped in. Kudos to them guys, man. They stepped in and they held their own. But when you got Jordan Poirier and Micah Hyde back there, bro, look, look ain't, there ain't going to be a whole lot going on in the, in the passing game, right? And so the Buffalo Bills defense, man, pass defense, number one in the league, strength, right? Strength. What's another strength of the, of the defense? I'm going to say this. The pass rush win rate. I had to say that slow because if I say it fast, man, it's like a tongue twister, man. Pass rush win rate. Okay. That's a stat that I know a lot of you guys, man, you, a lot of your hard analytics guys, man, I know you guys love that. Pass rush win rate. But I'm going to put that with the asterisk next to it, okay? Because we're going to get back to that a little bit later. But as it relates to pass rush win rate, the Buffalo Bills defense is ranked number six in the league, man. Number six in the league with a 46% pass rush win rate percentage. Yo, they were, the, yo, they were, they were rushing the passer, man. And they were doing a good job out of it, right? They did a good job doing it. Number six in the league, you've got, you've got to give them their credit, right? They were creating pressure, okay? But now, what does that say about the weaknesses? What does that reveal about the Buffalo Bills' defensive weaknesses? They were number one in pass defense, and number, number, number six in pass rush win rate, right? We know their strength is, 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 is in the pass, defending the pass, right? A lot of those statistical categories, right, she told you exactly what their strengths were. Total defense, total yard, yards per play, passing yards, passing yards per play, right? Uh, uh, first downs allowed, third down conversion rate, points per game. Look, look, the pass defense. The pass defense, man, was the strength of the defense. But it reveals the weaknesses, okay? And so what are the weaknesses of this defense, man? It's the rush defense. The rush game. The, in, in defending the rush, the Buffalo Bills defense, you know, wasn't that great, right? They're ranked number 16 in the league in rush defense. You say, Rev, 16? I mean, that's, that's like, you know, that's half. That's pretty good. That's 50%. That's, that's pretty good. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, that's pretty good, you know. I mean, if, if, if that's where you want the bar, if that's where you want to keep the bar, you know. Like I said, man, if you want to be content with, with just being, like, mediocre, then that's fine. That's fine. But comparatively speaking, compared to their to the strength, that's not that good. And I think that there's room for improvement there, right? Rush defense number 16. Another weakness. Sacks. You say, man, Rev, look, man, they, they were ranked number six in pass rush run weight. Man, what are you talking about? Sacks ain't, you know, ain't that big. Yeah, man, sacks. Now, like now look. They were ranked number 11 in the league in sacks. Can you believe that? Number 11 in the league in sacks. I think they had like 40 sacks for the year. Okay? But they're ranked number 11. Just outside of the top 10. But we can be better. We can be better. Okay, guys? And I'm, 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 I'm going somewhere with this, and I want to show you guys something. Okay? Number 11 in the league in sacks. Okay? And the other weakness is their cornerback depth. Man, that's probably like one of the main weaknesses of this defense is the depth at the cornerback position or the lack thereof, okay? So so now that we have an idea of their strengths and their weaknesses, let's go back to something, man, okay? Let's go back to something because this is going to be important for us. This is going to be important for us, all right? We've got number 11 in sacks, Okay, but we're number six in the in the league in pass rush win rate. Now, what's that all about, man? Essentially, that's just you know when the Bills put pressure on you, their guys they 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 beat who who they have who they have in front of them, right? And whenever we talk about pass rush win rate on the defense, you know because a lot of people talk about it, there's one guy in particular on this defense. That gets a lot of the praise, man. There's one guy on the defense, man, who gets, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's kind of polarizing in that aspect when you talk about pass rush win rate. That is my man, Jerry Hughes. 
Jerry Hughes. When you talk about pass rush win rate, Jerry Hughes, his name comes up in that conversation. Well, why is that? Huh? Why is Jerry's name come up in that conversation when we talk about pass rush win rate? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because Jerry Hughes finished the NFL. He finished the league. I mean, 2021, he finished the year with a 20.9% pass rush win rate. Okay? But not only did he, did he have a 20.9% pass rush win rate, he led the team in that statistical category. Okay? So when people talk about this, 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 this stat, they bring up Jerry Hughes, man, because he, lead, he, he led the team in it, right? And he does a good job at, at winning, okay? He does a good job at winning, and people use that as a way to say, man, look, look, Jerry, man, is the dude. He still got it. He still got it, right? But when you take Jerry Hughes's pass rush win rate of 20.9% and you hold it up to the rest of the NFL, he's not even in the top 10. He ain't even in the top 10, guys. Look it up yourself, okay? If you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't want to take my word for it, look it up yourself. He's not even in the top 10, okay? Um, when I was looking it up, look, it, it didn't even show anybody past the top 10. But the last guy, the number, number 10 in pass rush win rate was, I think, Max Crosby, and, he, and his was like, like 22%, okay? So Jerry, we know, is outside of the top 10. We don't know how far down he is, but nevertheless, He's not even in the top 10. So we're talking about him like, you know, man, like he's just, like he's great because, of, because he leads his team in this statistical category. And, he, and he's always, you know, winning his one-on-one matchups. But we also know that Jerry Hughes finished the lead the year with two sacks. Two. Count them. One. <laughs> two. He finished the, the year with two sacks, man. Okay? But, but with that being said, my man Mario Addison now, okay, because now we're getting somewhere. Mario Addison, okay, he wasn't in the conversation when it came to pass rush win rate, right? If Jerry wasn't in the top 10 when it came to that, okay, where do you think Mario fell? He fell a lot lower than, than, than Jerry, right? And he didn't even lead the team. Jerry's the one who led the team in pass rush win rate, but guess who's the guy who led the team in sacks? Go ahead and wait for it. I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll wait for you. Tell me. Yeah, Mario Addison. He's the one who led the team in sacks with seven. Seven sacks. He led the team with seven sacks, but his pass rush, pass rush win rate percentage was nowhere to be talked about. Nor to be found, right? Right? Because look, and I'm gonna say it like this, man. You know, even though that's that's a that's a that's a decent statistic, right? I don't believe it's 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 necessary. I don't, I don't believe it's a statistic, man. That 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 really shows you um, how much pressure the guys are getting. Because because to me, man, look, it's it's about finishing. It's about finishing, and the and and and, and the teams, man, that that get after the quarterback, they got dudes who finish. I got dudes who finish, okay? We know about the Pittsburgh Steelers and T.J. Watt. These guys finish. And then you can say, well, Rev, well, look how far they got in the playoffs. I, mean, I get that. I get that. All right? Okay? I get it. They had some other issues too, all right? But we're talking about the Buffalo Bills and how they can improve in their weakness, okay? Their weaknesses in sacks. Mario Addison led the team in sacks, seven of them. Count it, seven, all right? He had seven sacks. Now, you guys may may be saying, "Look, Rev, look, 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 man. Like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, bruh. You know, this, this, you know, the pass rush win rate, man, is 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 pretty good. All right, you nitpicking, Rev. You nitpicking, right? Um, you nitpicking, Jerry. You know, he, he's he's better than than you giving him credit for, and and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, you said, you know, we had like 40 sacks, and we were, you know, ranked like like, you know, uh." what, 12th in the league or 11th in the league in sacks, you're, you're nitpicking, Rev, you're nitpicking. All right, well, all right, if I'm nitpicking, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me talk to you about something here real quickly, okay? Let me ask you a question. When I say the number 26 
or, or better yet, 26%. What do you think about? Or what does that number mean to you? What does that percentage mean to you? 26%. What does that mean to you? You give up? Of course you do. Let me tell you what that means. 26% represents the percentage of sacks on this Buffalo Bills team, 2021 team, by non-defensive linemen. Did you hear me? 26% represents the percentage of sacks on this team by non-defensive linemen, guys. Non-defensive linemen. So out of, out of the 40 sacks, 26% of them were by non-defensive linemen, okay? Oh, you, oh, you want, all right, let me prove it to you. Jordan Poyer, three sacks. Matt Milano, three sacks. Teron Johnson, three sacks. Micah Hyde, one sack. Even Trey White, before he got hurt, he had half a sack. You know what I'm saying? So we've got, what is that? Ten and a half sacks. Ten and a half sacks out of their 40 sacks were by non-defensive linemen, guys. Non-defensive linemen. Look, I, I, I know you want to talk about how, you know, the pass rush is, is not that much of a problem. It's not an issue, guys. But, man, when you have 26% of the sacks being made by non-defensive linemen, that shows a glaring hole to me. That shows, like, that, that shows a huge hole to me, right? And it says that we need more sacks, more production out of the defensive line. That's what that says to me. Right. Come on now. We're not talking about perfection here, but we're talking about improvement. OK, we're talking about areas that we can improve in this defense and on the defensive line as it relates to sacks. We need more production out of the defensive line. Why? Why? Because we know that's what Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott want to do. They want to rush for get to the quarterback and drop eight in coverage. That's what they want to do. They want to rely on their defensive linemen to get after the quarterback, pressure them, and even get them down. Why? Because that plays into the strengths of the defense without having to rely so heavily upon the offense. You don't necessarily want to have to rely on the offense to, to get out to a huge early lead, right, that, that teams who don't have dynamic quarterbacks can really come back from to force them to pass the ball, and which plays into the strengths of the defense, which is the pass defense. No, you want to be sound, right? You want to have a team who can, a defense who can get, do the thing by themselves, man. A defense who can get after the quarterback, drop back in coverage, and say, like, like what you going to do with it? You can't do nothing with us. You're not throwing the ball, right? And you're not going to have time to throw the ball either because our front four are getting after it. And not only are they, are they, are they creating havoc and, and pressure, but they're actually bringing the quarterback down. Look, this league right now, where we see it, guys, especially in the AFC, with the way these quarterbacks are now developing and turning into, we got Josh Allen, right? Patrick Mahomes, uh, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson, uh, Joe Burrow to a degree, right? Look, what do these guys have in common? They have escapability, right? These guys can escape the pocket. That's why I don't care a whole lot about pass rush win rate if you can't get the guy down on the ground. How many times have you guys seen, right, the Buffalo Bills bring pressure and it flushes the quarterback only to have them escape and run 5, 10, 15 yards down the field for a first down on third and long. How many times have you seen that? I can't, I can't even count you know, how many times it's happened. It's, it's, it's been quite a bit, right? And I don't know about you, but that's infuriating for me to see that, oh, man, we almost got it. Oh, get him, get him, get him, get him. Oh, he escaped, right? You know, it, like this pass rush win rate would be good if, if, if we're talking about statue quarterbacks. Back in the day, Peyton Manning, right? Uh, you know, even Tom Brady to a degree, but even he can still dice it because he gets rid of the ball so fast. You know what I'm saying? But this, this, this league has shifted from those statue pocket quarterbacks now to guys who scramble. 
And you get these guys out of the pocket. They're even more dangerous, like Josh Allen and 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 and, and uh, uh, Pat Mahomes and Justin Herbert and you know Lamar Jackson. Deadly out of the pocket. So what does it do? How, what good does it do to win your pass rush if you can't sack them and they may escape the pocket and they're running twenty yards down the field against eight men in coverage? Like what? What good is it? You see what I'm saying? Now do you see why we need guys who can actually get home, who can actually sack the quarterback? I want guys who can get Pat Mahomes down. I want guys who can not only just 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 bring the pressure and get him to, to feel uncomfortable in the pocket, but I want guys who can keep him from scrambling. I don't want Pat I don't want Mahomes scrambling five, ten yards down the field, fifteen yards down the field. Man, I want him sacked. I don't want to see Justin Herbert taking off. I don't want to see Lamar Jackson taking off. I want to see him sacked. That's what I want. You want to you want to negate their strengths because those guys have legs too. You know what I'm saying? Those guys can escape, they can move. And you want to you want to keep them in the pocket and you want to take them down. That's why I believe that we need more sacks out of the defensive line. That's why I said that the sacks are like a weakness on this team. Where we're, we're missing that. You understand what I'm saying? We're missing that. That's all I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We need to get more production out of the defensive line, especially when you look at how much Brandon Bean has invested in this defensive line, right? Not to get it. You've got Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison both at what a, what a good 10 and a half plus mil each, right? And an average annual value or average annual salary, right? To only give you nine sacks for the year. You got two guys getting paid over $10 million and you can only get nine sacks out of them. Jerry Hughes, the guy who wins all the time, 20.9% pass rush win rate, two sacks. Come on, man. You guys, we have, we have to, we have, we, we, look, we got to set the bar higher than this, man. Okay. We've got to set the bar higher. All right. But that's enough talking about that. Okay, so 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 we we talked about that. The weakness is 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 one of the weaknesses, right? Was in the defensive line, the sacks. Okay, the next area of weakness we're going to talk about, man, is in the cornerback depth. The lack of cornerback depth. The secondary. Okay, the secondary. We we've got to talk about it because this is this is key. And and, and in my opinion, man, as it's, as as we sit right now, this is probably. The, uh, the, the, the priority right here, okay? Because think about it. We have to talk about Trey's injury, okay? We've got Trey's injury to deal with, okay? Now, whether he, we have to talk about that, right? Whether, whether he'll, he'll be back full strength, you know, or how long it's going to take, we, we don't know. That's an unknown, right? I mean, knock on wood, praying, you know, that Trey's comes back, that Trey comes back healthy, right? Um, but we just don't know. That's an unknown. Okay, and so for now, we can just kind of sit him on the back burner, um, praying and hoping that he's going to come back to full strength. We don't know when, okay, but but for time being, let's just act like we don't have him, okay, even though we know we're going to get him back, but let's just act like we don't have him, okay. Now we've got Levi Wallace, who's a free agent. Will he return? What are we going to do with Levi? You see what I'm saying? Is he going to come back? I mean, when you look at the numbers right now, he's a free agent. Now, now look, now, now last year he signed a one-year deal with the Bills. Okay, he signed a one-year deal with the Bills. Um, I'm saying, I, I, I'm guessing it's because he tested the market and realized, yo, it's not as hot as I thought it was going to be. So I come back and sign with the Bills, and Brandon was like, yeah, I'm gonna sign you for a one-year deal, right? You know when Brandon Bean tells tells a player, or oh, you know when they've earned the right to test free agency, you, you already know what that means, right? That that nine times out of ten they ain't coming back. He, he does not have them in his long-term plans, okay? So he gave, he gave a, a Levi a one-year deal. If he thought that Levi was the guy, the bona fide number two cornerback beside Trey White, he would have extended him last year, but he didn't do it. He gave him a one-year deal. Now, granted, Levi, I, he did well. He performed well this year. I'll give it to him, man. I was a Levi hater. Um, uh, he did, he played well. I'm not gonna lie, he played well. But now, can we improve? Can we do better? I think so. And when we talk about Levi's value now, uh, he's sitting at a nine point six million dollar average annual salary according to Spot Track. Okay, so what are you gonna do with that? Are you gonna pay that? 
Huh? Are you comfortable paying Levi Wallace that? I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not that comfortable, okay? But we still got to talk about it. As I take another sip of this processed juice. Okay? <laughs> All right? So Levi Wallace at $9.6 million average annual salary, according to Spot Track. All right? And then that leaves Dane Jackson. What are you going to do with him? You see? I mean, does, does Dane Jackson's presence on the field now, especially after what he was able to do when he had to step in after Trey's injury, right? And he and Levi had a had a man the cornerback position. Does he make Levi expendable? Oh, it's a fair question to ask, right? We got to answer this question. What are we going to do? What, like, what's going to happen? But beyond that, who do we have that we can really rely on and that we can really trust? Saran Neal got signed. I get that, but he's not starting the corner. Okay, we understand that. I think he's gonna he's gonna have a more uh, expanded role on the defense. I believe um, he's a legit special teamer, right? But I think he's gonna have an expanded role on the defense. Maybe in certain nickel packages, or whatever. You know, the, the big nickel guy, because um, he 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 does really good against the run when he when you when you when you put him in in that that type of package. Uh, maybe he subs out for Teron Johnson or something like that. You know, but. He's not he's not a boundary corner that you're going to put out there that you, you trust, okay? It's just not going to happen. All right, so, so we're looking at Trey White, Levi Wallace, free agent, and Dane Jackson. That's it that we trust. That's, that's it. We gotta, we, guys, we're talking about three corners here. Three, all right? And really, two, when you, when you talk about Trey being on the back burner because you don't know wh- when he's coming back, okay? And if he's going to have any, we just, we just don't know. It's an unknown. So Levi Wallace, free agent, Dane Jackson. Guys, that is a huge hole that must be filled. So what are we going to do at that at in that position, right? To me, that's that's, that's probably more important than, than pass rush or getting somebody who can who can sack the quarterback. We've got to solidify this cornerback room, guys, by any means necessary. Okay. So before we even talk about the draft, we remember this this episode is all about how we can attack the defense via free agency and fill the needs in free agency. Okay. So that way, when we go into the draft, we can sit back with our hands crossed. You know what I'm saying? Sit back with your favorite beverage or whatever and kick back and just watch Brandon Bean do his thing, okay? But for the time being, man, free agency is where it's at. So what are we going to do, huh? Well, this is what I want to talk about. This is what I want to transition. I want to transition, guys, into a few people who I think that are going to be maybe on the radar for Brandon Bean, okay? This is just a few guys that I think we can we can talk about, Um as, as potential suitors to come on in here um, for the Buffalo Bills defense and, and, and maybe, um, if not start, then at least, you know, provide some type of competition for Dane Jackson because I believe that Brandon Bean trusts Dane, right? I think he trusts him, which is why he only gave Levi Wallace a one-year deal, okay? And I think that he trusts him enough to probably let him, you know, it's like, it's, yo, it's your job to lose, man, you know? But we'll see. We'll see. All right, so let's look at free agent number one. Free agent number one is Kevin King, Green Bay Packers. Okay, maybe you've heard of him. He's 26 years old. The guy's measurables are six foot three, 200 pounds. Okay, now we know that that Brandon Bean and his staff, man, they love traits, right? They love guys who got traits. Kevin King has got traits, man. Six three, 200, long arms. He's 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 a heavy guy, right? He's got some. He's got some 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 weight to him, but he's long and lanky, sort of, right? He's a former second-round pick in 2017, okay? Um, last year, or 2021, he signed a one-year $5 million deal with the Packers after his rookie after his rookie deal. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, I mean, this possibly streams um, Brandon Bean's famous something-to-prove signing, right? You get those guys that are coming out of the rookie contract that maybe got drafted pretty high but didn't quite meet the expectations of their of their teams that drafted them, you know, but they still got something to prove. That's man. That's like perfect. Brandon Bean, you know, bring him in here. Let me sign him to a one or two year deal and let's see what he, what, what they can do. I mean, that's, that's exactly what they did with, with Jordan Poirier and Micah Hyde, right? They brought these guys in there, man. Right. They've been legit ever since. Now I'm not saying Kevin King is going to be that guy, but you know, he's a guy, he's a name that you can probably think about um, and consider, you know, Packers fans think that he's trash, <laughs> right? But we don't know, man. We, I mean, he could just be competition. You never know, but he's a guy that you can probably think about and talk about. Six foot three, 200 pounds, former second round pick. He's a former second round pick for a reason. The guy's got talent, 
Okay, maybe it could be just coaching or maybe it could just be he's taking them a long time or longer, you know, to develop. We know that this coaching staff trusts their coaches to coach these guys up. Maybe they can coach Kevin King up to his potential. I don't know about you, but man, at 6'3", 200, if we can coach him up to his potential, that guy seems like a guy that we, that, you know, that could fit. I don't know. What about you guys? Let me know in the comments what you think. Now, guy number two. Sidney Jones. Sidney Jones from the Seattle Seahawks, 25 years old, 6 foot, 180 pounds. Another former second round pick in 2017. Um, he signed a one year, $1.75 million deal with the Jags in 2020. Then he was traded to Seattle, all right, uh, for a six round pick. Okay, now the thing about Sidney Jones is that, you know, he's, he's dealt with injuries. Okay, he's dealt with some injuries, uh, you know, so far in his career. But, I mean, maybe he can be another guy. I mean, we've got the, what I believe to be the, the NFL's best uh, training facility, right? I mean, they, they, these guys, I mean, I mean, we've seen what's happened with the Bills, man. Like, these guys have stayed healthy because we've got a, a high investment in that department, right? C.D. Jones could be another guy, all right? And, let's, let's, and let's, let's, let's talk about my last guy here that could be on the radar during free agency that could fill the void. Maybe he can he can step in and start, or he can push. But I don't know. But this guy is my favorite, and that is none other than Dante Jackson. If maybe you haven't heard of him, um, but he is a Carolina Panther. All right, he's twenty six years old. He's a smaller guy. Okay, he's a smaller guy. He's not six three. He's not six foot. He's five ten. He's five ten, one hundred and eighty pounds, soaking wet. Okay, and he may be smaller than that. I don't know. But, I mean, he's probably what, what Taron Johnson size, maybe maybe a little smaller because I think Taron is a little bigger, right? 5'10", 180. You say, man, look, uh, how can a 5'10", 180 guy be the dude that we're looking for on the boundary, right? He's a former second-round pick in 2018. But get this, man, the guy has blazing speed, blazing speed. When you cut on the tape, it's evident, right? The, the, the guy can fly. In fact, he, he, he ran a 4'3", 240 in the combine. 4'3", 2. 4'3", The guy was moving. All right, he's got wheels. Um, if you remember correctly, Sean McDermott had said, even last year, that the goal was to add more speed on the defense. They've had their taste of Tyreek Hill burning them. They did it two times, man, twice in a row. Last year in the AFC Championship game, and this year Tyreek Hill burned them again in the division round. Do you think they're tired? Do you think they've had enough of Tyreek Hill running all over the place? I think so. Dante Jackson has plenty of speed to keep up with Tyreek Hill. 4-3-2. He can run with him. Okay? He can run with him. And if you watch this tape, man, what I love most about this guy, I mean, he's got zone skills out the wazoo. The guy is twitchy. He's, he's, he's a fast reaction guy. Uh, man, he, and, and, he, and he's physical, man. He lays, he lays the wood, man, when, when he, uh, at, at, you know, at the contact point. The guy is a very good cornerback, very good cornerback. Now, what he's going to be, what his value is going to be, I don't know. Smarter guys out there, you know, um, would, would know that than, than I do. I don't know. But I'm saying that he's my favorite guy. If you're going to go after a guy in free agency, man, Dante Jackson, man, when I watch the tape, the dude can play. He can play, and I don't have any problem with, with adding him to the team and, 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 and letting him compete, you know, shoot. I mean, if all things – if you know if all us fails, I mean he can compete. I mean he can he can he can spell a Taron Johnson in the slot. The guy has that type of versatility too, man. He's a very good cornerback, and so so those are my three picks right now for free agency for the cornerback position. We've got uh, uh, Kevin King for the Green Bay Packers. We got Sidney Jones from the Seattle Seahawks, and then we've got Dante Jackson. All right, now moving along, moving along, moving along um, to the last position group that I think we need to focus on now is the defensive line. Okay, the defensive line guys, we've we've got to do better. Um, when it comes to stopping the run and rushing the passer, but more importantly, getting after the quarterback, sacking the quarterback, okay? We've got to do more. I mean, we've got guys, man. I mean, look, we got Jerry Hughes, Mario Addison. we got Starla Tulele, um, Harrison Phillips, right, and Oliver. And then we got the young guns, man, and Greg Rousseau and, and Boogie Basham and A.J. Epinesa. We got, we got, some, we got some, a mixture of youth and age there. And then guys who are at the tail end of their careers. What are we going to do at that position, man? Well, the first thing I think we need to focus on, man, is it was the one tech, one tech defensive tackle. I'm talking about the hog mollies here. I'm talking about the big space eating guys. Okay, we know that the that that, that uh, 
Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott in this defense, man, they they have been looking for that one tech. Okay, now they 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 had him and they got him in Star Latulale. Okay, but you know, uh, maybe he hasn't lived up to expectations or certain expe- certain fan expectations. But you know, he's not gonna. This is not a stat position. Okay, um, I think Star has done you know what he came in here to do. And uh, yeah, I know people sour on him for that contract, but you know, we had to overpay. I mean, it is what it is. If you want to get him here, you just got to overpay sometimes in free agency, especially at that time when we're just building. You're just not going to get guys to come in here and take discounts when your team is trash. <laughs> okay, let's just keep it real. All right. But now that our team is better, maybe we can get guys who, who are more uh, willing to take those discounts. But Sarla Tulele, for the most part, man, he has done an admirable, an admirable job. He's done pretty good. Okay, at the one tech, he's, he's done his job. Okay, now, now I know people sour over him because he took last year off, whatever. The man had the right to take the year off last year because of COVID reasons. He came back, caught COVID, right? So people are wondering, I know I'm wondering, like, what is he going to do? Is he going to stay or is he going to retire? What, what's he, what's he, what's he going to do? But he, but he still, when he came back, you know, it took him a while, but he was playing pretty good. He was playing pretty good. So we can't do anything with the man's contract right now. Okay, we can't cut him. We can't do that. We just, we're just we stuck with it. So we're going to have to deal with Star for at least this year, right? And then, and then move on from him next year. Okay, but we still need to talk about depth behind that, behind him uh, because another guy is a free agent, and that's Harrison Phillips, who stepped in for him and did pretty well this year. When you went, man, when you watched the tape and you saw Harrison Phillips with next to Ed Oliver, man, they got, they, man, hey, they were doing the thing, man. And, and, and Harrison was holding his own. But we know that that's not Harrison's uh, natural position. It even looked like he put on some weight this year, anticipating a, a move to one tech. But that's not his natural position, man. He's he's kind of a tweener, but he's at three tech, man. He's he's three hundred pounds, man. Maybe three five, three ten, but that's about it. That's his max, okay. But I'm talking about we need guys who are three twenty, three thirty. Like we need we want we want some girth, man. Some beef right there, man. Right now, Star he plays light, okay. But he has the strength, man, to really take on those double teams. But we need somebody who's big. But not just big for no reason. A la Vernon Butler. Okay. We gotta get rid of that guy. Okay, we gotta get rid of Vernon Butler. He he's 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 trash, but we gotta get rid of him. Okay. So anyway, we gotta talk about the one tech defensive tackle, man. He's hog mollies, and I've got a few guys that I think we should look at. All right, number one is Daquan Jones. Okay, moving along. He plays for the Carolina Panthers, of course, you know, in like Carolina North, right? In Buffalo. Uh he's 30 years old, six foot four, 320 pounds. Okay, he's a former fourth round pick of the Titans in 2014. The guy's a he's a beast, right? He was a beast with the Titans. Um, he played he played good for for Carolina. He signed a one year deal with them uh, last year. Okay, and maybe you sign him to a two year deal or maybe even a three year deal and uh, and supplement that with a rookie draft pick, right? You know, um, so that way he's there when Star leaves, and, and that way you don't sign him to a one year deal because then you get like next year you're like you're gonna be out two defense tackles, right? And you're gonna be in the same position again. So you kind of give him a longer deal so that way he can overlap stars deal this year and then he'll be there for the rookie as he grows and develops you know what i'm saying so daquan jones man we put on the tape the guy the guy can do it he's big he's beefy he's meaty six foot four 320 pounds he has the he has a size man to hold up in the trenches and he's an older guy so he's a vet we know that that that, that this coaching staff values veterans at key positions on at, across the entire team right uh, position groups, position rooms, rather, is what I'm trying to say. So Daquan Jones can fill that void, 30 years old. The next guy on the docket, man, is Jonathan Hakins from the Las Vegas, I almost said Los Angeles, Las Vegas Raiders, 29 years old. He's six foot three, 340 pounds. The guy is a big, fat nose tackle, man. A guy, that's what you want. Big guys, man, who can move dudes, right, and can't be moved. Again, he's another, he's another former second-round pick, okay, of the Giants in 2012, but he's been in the league for a while, okay? So he's got that experience. He played with the Colts and the Raiders most recently, okay? Maybe you can sign him to the same thing, another two- or maybe three-year deal, okay, to supplement a rookie, all right? But be there to provide depth, get Harrison out of that one tech. Maybe you bring Harrison back, too, let him sit there and play three tech, okay? But that's another guy. But now, here's my number one guy. Here's my favorite guy. Now, he, I know what you guys are going to say. You know, he may be a little old in the tooth, okay? A little long in the tooth. But man, oh man. And he's probably going to cost some money. Maybe. I don't know. But this guy, when you look at him, if you could see what I'm seeing, this dude is a monster. And I'm talking about none other than the Brandon Williams of the Baltimore Ravens. Guys, look. 
I know he's 33 years old, but he ain't really that old. The guy can still play, okay? 33 years old, but the guy is six foot one, 335 pounds, low to the ground. Look, if you've seen Brandon Williams, my gosh, have you seen this guy's biceps? This guy's arms are like freaking tree trunks for arms. The dude is rocked up. He's a rocked up nose tackle. The guy is huge, solid. Like, I mean, I've, I've loved Brandon Williams. I, I mean, every time I watch the Ravens, I've just, I can't keep my eyes off of that guy on the defense. And I, and I just kind of covet that guy, right? I, I just kind of, I do. I can't, I can't lie. I'm like, oh man, I wish we had him. But now possibly it's, it's, it's a possibility. We, I don't know. We, we'll see. We know, I mean, he's, he signed a, con, man, a big contract with the Ravens back in 27. He signed a five-year, $52 million deal. $10.5 million average annual salary, Okay. It's a lot of money, but well worth it, okay? This guy is strong as an ox. He's unmovable. He's a dog, and he's got leadership just oozing out of his veins, man. I mean, can you imagine bringing this guy into the locker room, into the defensive uh, room, the D-line? Bring Brandon Williams is instant cred, instant cred. You put him here, even with Star for a year, and you let those guys rotate, and then you draft another guy and you let them and you let that rookie just develop. We I mean, think about the leadership that that guy brings, man. Being around those guys, man, in Baltimore, Terrell Suggs, man, and Clayus Campbell too this year, man. And 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 uh man, look, this guy has got it. Okay. He has got it. And I think he's a perfect guy that you would want to go after in free agency. Um, depending upon the money, right? And we never know. I mean, he could, I mean, he's been with the Ravens his entire career. He may, he may elect just to sign another deal with the Ravens, another one, two year deal and retire. He, I mean, he's got a lot invested in that town. You never know, but you never know what the Ravens are looking for, right? They could be like, you know, at a, at a position where they may be wanting to move on. I don't know, but if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm knocking on that man's door. I'm contacting his agent. I'm trying to see what this guy is going to do. Right. Bring him on the team. All right. Now, last but not least, guys, and I thank you for guys for watching me. I thank you guys for, 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 for staying with me, man. I really appreciate that, man. And I might ask you again, man, if this video, if this, if this show has given you any value, man, give me a, uh, man, a like, man, uh, smash that like button. Leave me a comment in the comment section. I'm going to get with you. We're going to chop it up. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and subscribe if you feel led to do so. But moving on to the last group, man, is the edge rushers, the head hunters. The headhunters. This is where it's at, man. This is the guys that I'm talking about where we need the guys who can get sacks. I only got two guys that I think we should go after. Only two. Only two. All right, because we look at Mario Addison and, and Jerry Hughes. I mean, what do you want to do? Those guys are, are, are up in age, right? They're making a lot of money. They've made a lot of money. I think we can get more for the same amount. I think, I think we can move on, right? Granted, they're going to bring in probably a vet, okay? But I think we can move on from, if not both, at least one of them. If there's one guy that we keep, I say Mario Addison, because at least he has a production. Forget that pass rush win rate. The guy sacks, seven sacks versus two. I'm taking the sacks all day, all day, okay? Say what you want, hate on me all you want, whatever. Yeah, I don't care, all right? Sign him to one-year deal, whatever. But I digress. If there's a guy you're going to go after in free agency, you want to target somebody who's younger, right? And who, who has equal or more production. And that is my man, Emmanuel Ogba from the Miami Dolphins. 28 years old, six foot four, 275 pounds. He's a power defensive end. Maybe he can get on that side with, with, with Groot. Or maybe he goes on the other side, on the weak side. I don't know. I don't care. Get him on the team. The guy's productive. He's got back-to-back -back seasons with nine sacks in 2020 and 2021. Okay? Nine sacks back-to-back. -back. You know what that means? That means that he's, he's matched the production of both Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison in back-to-back -back years by himself. By himself. Okay? By himself. And you got Jerry Hughes at that $10.75 million and then, and then Mario Addison at $10.15 $10 .10 million average annual salary each in 2021. Okay? Whereas this guy right here, Spot Track estimates his market value at three-year $34.4 million. A $10.1 million average annual salary. Give me that guy. Give me that guy. Okay? I, give me him. 
for half the amount of money I'm spending on both Mario Addison and Jerry Hughes with the matching production. You give me him for 10 mil and he can match the production of two guys. Yeah, I'm taking it. All right. And he's younger, a lot younger. Emmanuel Ogba, ladies and gentlemen. And last but not least, if you're going to swing big, you might as well swing for the fences. Okay. And this is my man, none other than the Chandler Jones. <sighs> yeah, I know. You guys may be scared. You may be scared of the fact that, you know, he's going to cost a lot of money and whatever. You never know what Brandon Bean can pull out of his out of out of his hat, right? Brandon Bean, you know, he can do it. He can manipulate the cap. We all know that, right? Especially with the way this cap is 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 exploding, right? They can they can sign these deals and push a lot of that cap hit to further years, right? So even though you look at a certain average annual salary, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be their cap hit for that year, okay? So don't let average annual sal- salary scare you off, okay? They can they can they can work that thing, man. Okay, and fit him under the cap for that particular year. Chandler Jones, man, 32 years young, but extreme production. Six foot five, 265 pounds, 10 and a half sacks in 2021 alone, right? He far passed the sack production of, our, of both of our guys, right? Now listen to this. Two-time first team all pro. Four-time pro bowler. 107.5 career Sacks. Let that sit in for just a minute. 107.5 career sacks, and a man is only 32. Okay. He is a future Hall of Famer, in my opinion. Okay. Now, yes, he's going to be priced. He has an estimated market uh, market value of three year, $43.7 million, which is about 14 and a half mil in average annual salary per spot track. But you know what, guys? Yo. If Brandon Bean can fit him in the cap, get him. Get him. I'm talking about this dude is going to be instant impact. Bring the sacks, baby. Bring the sacks. You know what I'm saying? And on top of that, to put the cherry on top, he's a Rochester, New York native, man. We're talking about bringing the man back home, Bills Mafia. Can I get an amen up in his place? Bring Chandler Jones back home, man. Bring him back home. I don't care. Brandon, if you can work it, if you happen to be watching this or listening, man, Brandon Bean, hey, work your work, man. Do what you got to do, Brandon, big ball of bean, and bring Chandler Jones back to Western New York. That guy is phenomenal. If you're going to swing, if you're going to go big, you better go for the fences. Go big or go home, ladies and gentlemen. Ain't that right? Chandler Jones, my guy. And that is what I'm talking about. Bill's Mafia. Man, look. I know we talked a lot this night. I know we talked a lot today about what we're going to do in episode one, man. I know we talked about this offseason moves and, 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 and attacking the defense and free agency, man. We covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of ground, and I appreciate you guys for sticking with me, man. I'm so excited about where we're going, where we're headed. Episode two is coming up shortly, coming up soon. And we're going to talk about the offense, about attacking the offense, man. Attacking the offense, but Bills Mafia, stand up. I really appreciate you guys, man. But I've got some last words for you. Just some last words as I, as I part and we go on about our merry old way and do our thing and get ready for the combine coming up here in the next few days. But guys, I just want to remind you guys, man, okay? I want to remind you guys. Take this time right now to look around you. Look around you in this world. Count your blessings, okay? Count your blessings. Understand that There are people who have it worse off, okay? But as you count your blessings, man, and you look around, make sure you do three things for me. Make sure you, number one, love unconditionally, okay? This world is in need of love, true love. Make sure you love unconditionally. Make sure you serve humbly. Serve your brothers and sisters, man, with humility, okay? Understanding that there are people who have needs and whose needs may be greater than yours, Serve them humbly. And lastly, lead intentionally. Be leaders, man, and women. Lead with intention, with purpose. Okay? Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining me and on a first-time show of Rated Rev. You guys, I am so excited. 
I really, really, really appreciate you so much for tuning in with me and sticking with me, guys. Like I said earlier, if this video, if this podcast, if this show gave you any value at all, do me a favor. Like, comment, and subscribe. Like, comment, and subscribe. And even share it if you have to, okay? And follow me on Twitter at the Rev. Roads. But until next time, guys, God bless, grace, and peace. I love you guys. Go Bills.